get started and I'll just, I'll, I'll talk slowly. Um, so welcome everybody. Uh, this is actually our final uh, lecture uh, this year in our Keeping an Eye on Innovation lecture series for uh, 2021. My name is Carl Chucky. I'm the uh, Chief Executive Officer and Chief Medical Officer at the Retina Foundation. And I really want to thank everyone for being here with us uh, tonight. Uh, before we get started, just a few housekeeping items that I think will help uh, with the number of people that will be listening. Uh, Dr. Pardue uh, gave us her nice presentation. You know, please mute your video um, during the presentation. So that'll, and also, there will be a, a Q and A session at the end of the video, uh, so you can. Uh, the best way is actually to post questions on the chat, and we'll get to those at the end. and um, And the and the lecture is also being recorded, and will be available um, afterward as well. So, in case you miss something, um, you can always uh, replay it. And so, um, mostly, I want to thank uh, Dr. Um, and Mrs. William Hutton, uh, they've been our um, sponsors for this uh, lecture series. And, and the goal of the lecture series is really to, to educate the public. You know, we, we have three core areas that we're very uh, proud of. We have uh, pediatrics, we have inherited retinal disorders and age-related macular degeneration. We're very fortunate in um, being able to invite, uh, you know, world leaders in, in these areas uh, to discuss their research with us and the community at large uh, here in Dallas and, and sometimes in other areas as well. So we're, we're very uh, excited. And I really don't wanna you know, say too much other than I'm gonna turn the, the program over to Dr. Krista Kelly, who is in our uh, pediatric uh, group and, uh, and take it away, Krista. Thanks, Dr. Chalky. So it's my uh, great pleasure and privilege to introduce Dr. Michelle Pardue for tonight's Keeping an Eye on Innovation Lecture. Dr. Pardue received her doctorate in vision science and biology from the University of Waterloo and then completed her postdoctoral training in visual electrophysiology at Loyola School of Medicine and Heinz Veterans Affairs Hospital in Chicago. Currently, she is the interim chair and professor at Georgia Institute of Technology and Emory University. And she's also a senior research uh, career scientist in the Atlanta Veterans Affairs Medical Center. Dr. Pardue's research focuses on clinically relevant treatments for retinal disease that can make a difference in the quality of life of patients. Currently, her lab is investigating the retinal mechanisms of myopia and developing neural protective strategies for retinal disease. And then more pertinent to tonight's talk, Dr. Pardue and her lab are developing new screening and treatment methods for early vision loss and diabetes. So aside from all of these research accomplishments, Dr. Pardue is also very passionate about teaching and mentoring future and early career scientists. And I've recently actually benefited from this passion through the Association for Research and Vision and Ophthalmology's Women's Leadership Development Program that's geared to um, helping early career scientists um, in, in the beginning of um, setting up labs and all that kind of stuff. And um, so she was my mentor for the year and she guided me through you know, the typical learning hurdles of an early career scientist, as well as the additional challenges that a worldwide pandemic has posed for me. And she provided me invaluable guidance through what is arguably the hardest year in my life and in most uh, other people's lives. So for that, I'm very grateful. She was a, a fantastic mentor and I've learned a lot from her. Um, so yeah, so she spent a whole year listening to me talk about my research and now I'm really excited to finally get to hear her speak about her research as I'm sure that you guys are as well. So tonight, Dr. Pardue will talk to us about detecting and treating early signs of vision loss and diabetes. Dr. Pardue. Thanks so much, Krista. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here today um, to be able to talk to you all. And um, yes, I, as Krista said, I had the privilege of getting to know her through this mentoring program, um, through this organization we are involved in. And, and really, um, I've, I've learned as much and got as much mentoring, I think, from Krista as, as, as hopefully she got from me. So it, it was really a, a pleasure to work with her. So let me uh, go ahead and, and share my screen here with you. OK, 
Okay, so hopefully you can now see my screen. Okay, great. Um, so what I'd like to talk to you today about is my work that is on detection and treating early signs of vision loss and diabetes. And this first slide here just kind of um, gives an overview of what I intend to talk about. So when a patient is first diagnosed with hyperglycemia or diabetes, um, they then are susceptible to different types of complications. And one of those complications is diabetic retinopathy. Um, and so diabetic retinopathy, um, we currently diagnose by taking pictures of the inside of the eye. Um, this is called a fundus photo. And this typically then leads to um, vision loss. And what I'm gonna tell you about today is a non-invasive method to measure retinal function, um, which you can see here in this, um, let me put on my, my laser pointer here, um, here in this image. And so how this early detection allows us to have a new window for treatment. And I'm gonna tell you about our studies using levodopa as that treatment, and then how that leads to prevention. So we can prevent these retinal vascular lesions and the vision loss. So diabetes is um, a disease that has a huge impact on our, our global society. So here I'm, I'm showing you a plot that shows the number of adults with diabetes. And so you can see the year here, hopefully you can see that. And then at the top in the bubble is the number of people in millions that have diabetes. And you can see in 2019, there were 463 million people in the world that had diabetes. Now it's a tremendous number. And what's even more impressive is that you can see that this trajectory of how many people have diabetes has continued to rise in an alarming rate. And the predictions for 2025 and 2030 continue to increase. And what's maybe even more alarming is the predictions that were made for these years back in 2003 were 333 million. That was revised in 2006 to be 380 million. And you can see in 2030 that we have the numbers increasing till in 2019, they're estimating that we're gonna have 578 million people globally that have diabetes. So it's just staggering actually, when you think of the number of people that have um, this disease. Now, if we focus just on the US, this um, map here shows you the percentage of people across the different states that have diabetes. And in the South, I'm of course located in Georgia, you guys are located in Texas, but similarly, um, we see this, this Southern belt that has between 10 and 15% of the people um, have diabetes. And so in the US, we're talking about about 34 million people um, that have diabetes. So again, a tremendous amount. Now, when you have diabetes, you are susceptible to a number of different complications. And one of those complications is to have retinal disease or diabetic retinopathy. And this is actually a leading cause of vision loss in middle-aged adults. And in fact, one out of three individuals with diabetes have retinopathy. And that equates to 7.6 million Americans who currently have diabetic retinopathy. Again, a tremendously large number. Now we have methods to try to screen for this disease. Um, and the American Diabetes Association recommends that individuals who have diabetes go for a yearly screening. And so that looks like um, this. So this is a fundus camera here you can see. And this is a, an advertisement that says, if you have diabetes, have you had your eye screening this year? So you can see that the clinician or the technician who is running the test can um, see the person's eye. And then they take a picture that looks like this down here at the bottom right, that is the inside of the eye. And you can clearly see the blood vessels. Um, and so in the US, there's over 34 million people that have diabetes that need this yearly screening, a tremendous number. And you can imagine that there's a, a big problem with getting people to come in for their diabetic screening. Typically this needs to be done 
at um, an eye clinic of some sort that actually has this specialized equipment that's quite expensive um, in order to get this picture of the inside of their eye and see if they have any changes. And so even though, um, you know, I'm gonna show you some, some data that suggests that it takes a number of years to develop, um, you know, the changes in the eye, there's some young people, and, and I've met some of these that even in their early 20s, they go for their first eye exam and they find out they have diabetic retinopathy, which is really sobering for these individuals that they basically have signs that they're gonna have vision loss later in their lives. So when the clinician looks inside the eye, what they're looking for are changes to these, these blood vessels. They're looking for things like hemorrhages, so um, blood vessels actually bleeding, something called cotton wool spots. Um, and then they're also looking for neovascularization or new blood vessel growth that's happening in the eye. And if we were to look at this at a, a microscopic level, you can see here that there's a blood vessel and there's these, these cells called pericytes that are around the blood vessels that actually die and come away from the blood vessel. And that's partly why the blood vessel begins to be leaky. And then if we can look at a higher mag, you can see this kind of microvascularization or these abnormalities that um, happen in the microvascular um, retina. And so that, those are, are problems because when we have leaky blood vessels, that means blood is getting into the retina, that can cause um, edema or swelling of the retinal vessels, which can lead to vision loss. If it's um, near vascularization or new blood vessel growth, then that can also block the ability of light to get to the retina and get a normal um, you know, image that's, that's formed on the retina. So all these things work together to cause vision loss. So as I said, the, a, an individual gets diagnosed with hyperglycemia that they have diabetes, and it actually takes about 10 to 15 years to develop the retinal vascular lesions that we're looking at with this yearly exam. And if untreated, this can actually cause vision loss. So you can see that there's a big time window here where we potentially could have some sort of early detection. And if we could have early detection, then we have a new treatment window that opens up that could lead to prevention of these retinal vascular lesions and prevention of vision loss. So my lab has been very interested in determining whether we can detect diabetic retinopathy prior to these vascular changes. And we're using a functional biomarker that is a non-invasive electroretinography or ERG. So you can think of this as um, an EKG for the eye. So we're familiar with an EKG. It's, um, you know, we put electrodes on, on the chest and we can actually measure the electrical activity of the heart. So this is somewhat similar. We put electrodes um, on the eye, as you can see this little thread type electrode that's on the lower part of the eye here, or we put electrodes near the eye and we present a flash of light. And when we present that flash of light, we can measure the electrical activity of the retina in response to that flash. And what we get is a very characteristic waveform, kind of like an EKG is very characteristic. Um, and you can see here that this is what it looks like. And it has different components that we label an A wave and a B wave. And then there's these little wavelets um, that we call oscillatory potentials or OPs. And I'm showing you them filtered out down here. And then I'd like to show you them um, in a kind of more magnified view. So these are these oscillatory potentials. They're actually generated from the inner retina. And you can see that we number them. So we um, measure them, we just call them OP1, OP2, three and four. And, um, and then we're very interested in the implicit time for this pr presentation. So the time it takes from the beginning of the flash until the peak of that particular OP wave is the time that I'm most um, interested in. Now, these oscillatory potentials have actually been reported to be delayed in patients with diabetes um, in multiple studies. In fact, I'm showing you um, a study from 1998 where they measured oscillatory potentials 
in various stages of diabetic retinopathy. So these are the typical stages we have. So this um, top one is no retinopathy. And then we have this, the clinical stages of um, retinopathy. And so as we go down, it gets worse. And you can notice from the waveforms here that at the first, they have these little wavelets, these oscillatory potentials. And as we progress with the disease, then those wavelets go away. But what I also would like you to notice that as we progress with the disease, this wave here um, at the top begins to be delayed. And I've, I've drawn this orange line here. So hopefully you can really tell that as we get to this um, you know, line C, you can see that the wave is much slower and then it gets slower. Of course, it's also getting smaller. Um, and so it's very obvious that these oscillatory potentials are changing. And this work when it was done was all done using a bright flash stimuli. So this, um, we can use different types of flash stimuli when we do an ERG to stimulate different types of retinal cells. So using a bright flash stimuli is clinically the way we, we normally measure an ERG and especially these oscillatory potentials. So um, in my lab, we started off using um, a rodent model of diabetes. And this rodent model, we can make um, diabetic using a toxin called streptozotocin or STZ. And what this drug does is it actually kills the beta cells that are in the pancreas that produces insulin. And so when we give the animals this drug, they become hyperglycemic and, and diabetic. So um, this is the work that was done by um, this graduate student, an MD, PhD student in my lab, Harry Ong, who's now gone on and um, is, is now a, a, a assistant professor. Um, and he um, measured these ERGs and the oscillatory potentials at different stages of diabetes. So the blue line at the top is the control animals. And then we measured um, the response at four, eight, and 12 weeks post STZ. And what I hope you can see is that there's a gray line going down here that marks the, o, the OP1 in the control. And then anytime you see an arrow, um, it means that there's a delay, a significant delay in that waveform. So using a bright flash, it takes 12 weeks to begin to see a delay in this rodent model. Now, importantly, when Harry used a dim flash, you can see that the response is already delayed at four weeks post STZ. And at eight weeks, it's even more delayed and 12 weeks, it's even more delayed. Now, like the clinical case that I just showed you, you can also see that these oscillatory potentials get smaller as we go. But the earliest sign that there's something wrong is actually this delay that we see here at the four week post STZ with this dim flash. So this is really important because as I said, clinically, um, the bright flash is what we're using. So we typically don't look at these oscillatory potentials using a dim flash stimuli. So we think that this is really important because it's showing that the cells in the retina, the rod photoreceptors that are sensitive to dim light are the first to be affected by diabetic retinopathy. Now, um, just to make a, the story a little simpler, I'm not going to show you all the data that we've collected across a number of different studies, but I'd just like to, to assure you that we've actually replicated this many times in, in rats and in mice and also in humans to show that this delay can be seen anytime um, that there's diabetes in the early stages prior to any vascular changes. So this is really exciting and, and something that we thought Wow, um, so using the ERG in the clinic, using this dim flash could be really useful for screening patients that have diabetic retinopathy. But there's a problem with this as a, a screening tool. And the problem is that our current ERG testing methods aren't really suitable for some sort of outpatient screening. And so the reason for that is first of all, when we do an ERG, we actually dark adapt the eye. We put dilating drops into the eye and we dark adapt for as long as 20 or 30 minutes to make sure that the retina is, is well dark adapted when we present that first flash. The next thing um, that we typically do is we put electrodes on the cornea itself. 
And so you can see there's a thread type um, variety or there's a variety that's a contact lens that we put on the lens or on the eyeball, on the cornea itself. And of course we're, we're putting in a, a, a numbing drop on the cornea to make sure that there's no feeling there as we put this on. So again, as a screening tool, this is kind of cumbersome, not ideal. The second or the third thing is actually just the size of this ERG testing apparatus. So this is called a desktop Gonsfeld that would actually present the flash of light. So an individual would put their heads here um, in, in this location, and you can see that it's, it's very large. So this instrument has a pretty large footprint um, that isn't easily you know, just moved around. And it also takes up a fair, fairly large space if you're thinking about it as a screening tool. And finally, the last thing that you really need to analyze, you know, current ERGs is you need an expert who is actually going to analyze this, these waveforms and interpret them. So none of these characteristics are, are ideal to create a, a screening tool. So what was our solution to that? Well, our solution was to use a commercial device um, called the Redeval, which is made by LKC Technologies. And you can see that this is very different than that desktop Gonsfeld. This is a little handheld device um, that you just hold up to one eye. And doing that, um, it'll present a flash of light at the eye, which is very convenient and portable. And at the same time, you can see that this is the electrode that's actually placed on the cheek below the eye. And it's just a sticker electrode. So there's nothing invasive um, about this particular um, ERG device and, and the recording methods. Now, we only um, found that we could dark adapt for a very short time. Um, eight to 10 minutes was sufficient for this dim flash that we're actually gonna present um, in order to screen for diabetic retinopathy. And um, a, a technician in my lab, lab, Kara Motz, who's now a PhD student, um, did a study with a number of patients um, at the VA who were diabetic. And what she um, did is she compared non-diabetic controls, and this is the first group, to patients that had diabetes but had no signs of clinical retinopathy, meaning that when we looked at the fundus photos, there was no signs of any vascular changes. But you can see here in these, these are called violin plots, that we have very um, different responses. So these are the OP implicit times, and the controls range from about 26 milliseconds to a maybe 36, 37 milliseconds. And these violin plots show you kind of the shape of where the majority of the people are. So the majority of the people had a response that was around about 35 milliseconds. Now, if we look at the patients that had diabetes without retinopathy, you can see that their responses in general were much slower. And slower responses means that there's worse function happening in the retina. And so you can see that the majority of these are right around this range of about 37 um, milliseconds. So these are significantly different um, implicit times or timing that's happening between these two groups. And so this um, was really exciting when we were able to see this um, in this group, especially with this handheld device and with a, a skin electrode that's very non-invasive that we could just put on the face. Now, when we have um, this early detection, what it enables us to do is reveal a new therapeutic window, a, a window where we could actually treat diabetic retinopathy sooner than current methods. And so the current methods to treat diabetic retinopathy include anti-VEGF injections. So these are injections into the eye um, that happen on a, a regular basis. Um, there is laser surgery to actually burn off the, the abnormal blood vessel growth or um, corticosteroids are also used. And so these are all the FDA approved um, therapies. And I would argue that these are really mid to late stage disease when these are being used because they're really all targeting these vascular defects. So our goal was to treat diabetic retinopathy early and then to prevent any kind of vision loss. Now, what, what to focus on, how to, how to actually treat it. 
Well, um, what we found is that the dopamine levels um, are decreased in the diabetic retinopathy. So dopamine is a neuromodulator in the retina. And you can see here when we took our diabetic mice, there's a significant decrease in the, the amount of dopamine that's in the retina. And this has also, also been reported in other studies as well. And in fact, if you look throughout the body, it turns out that dopamine is decreased in the brain and it's also decreased in the kidneys. And this is kind of interesting because these are other areas of the body where diabetic complications are actually quite common. You can have diabetic um, cognitive defects as well as um, you know, diabetic um, issues with the kidneys. So when we look at kind of dopamine and how dopamine is made in the body, we have tyrosine, um, which then is converted into L-DOPA or DOPA, um, which then is converted into dopamine. So if we give L-DOPA or levodopa as a treatment, we can actually increase the amount of dopamine that's made in the body. And this is um, what um, Harry Yong and Moon Kim Han did in my lab. And so we first did this in animal models. And so here we're taking mice and we're chronically giving them L-DOPA treatment. So every day they got an injection of um, L-DOPA. And this happened right after we induced the diabetes. And then we measured um, their ERGs. And so here I'm showing you the results of the control mice at the top. Um, and then these are the uh, a, res a response from a mouse that is diabetic, um, but got vehicle treatment. And hopefully you can see that there's a clear delay here um, in the oscillatory potentials. But when we treat the animals with L-DOPA, we see that the delay is no longer present. So treating the animals with L-DOPA was able to significantly improve um, the function of these oscillatory potentials and of the retina. So again, this is a pretty exciting result. It worked um, much better than we were actually expecting. And so um, recently we've actually moved this into a clinical trial using um, patients. And so again, this is work that Cara Montz has done um, in the lab. And so we compared patients that were not diabetic with patients um, that were diabetic that did not have retinopathy and um, we gave them Cinemet, um, at which is just a levodopa drug. And then we tested them with that handheld Retival that I showed you using this dim flash stimuli. And so here I'm showing you the oscillatory potential time at baseline here at the first time point, and then two days later. And what's remarkable is just in two days of taking the levodopa, and this is just a, a pill that they take twice a day, you can see it's already significantly improved the function in almost every single one of the patients that was taking levodopa. So we were surprised at how fast um, this was actually having an effect. Now, um, Cara went on to test the patients for two weeks of taking the levodopa. So here I'm showing you um, the control group in the black again, baseline, and then two weeks after. And you can see that the patients that were on levodopa at baseline have a significant delay um, compared to the baseline values um, of the non-diabetics non controls. But then after two weeks, these oscillatory potential um, timing is the same as the control group. So uh, this is pretty remarkable um, because it actually suggests that the levodopa is recovering the retina. Not just that it protects with um, the progression of the disease, but it's actually able to restore um, the response back to a normal response. So again, really um, exciting results. Now, one of the things that um, we of course wanted to know was, okay, we have this um, hyperglycemia that, that develops and we have these vascular lesions and we're saying that somewhere in here you get um, the, these neuronal changes as well. Well, um, if you give L-DOPA treatments somewhere in this window, is it gonna actually pro 
prevent these vascular lesions? And that's a really important question, right? Because we know these vascular lesions are the ones that are, are really leading to the vision loss that we recognize clinically. So um, being as, as part of um, the VA, we have access to a really large um, clinical um, data warehouse, and this is called Vinci. And so we can actually probe this, um, these healthcare records of literally millions of, of veterans to look to see if veterans that are taking dopamine drugs, if that provides any benefit and any delay in actually seeing um, these retinal vascular lesions. And this is work that um, has been done by Kyle Chesler and Dr. Rachel Allen um, in my lab. And so let me show you um, this data from this retrospective study. So again, these are diabetic veterans that are either taking um, levodopa treatments, and that's shown in the green, versus um, patients that have diabetes but are not taking any of those dopamine treatments. And again, you know, these nice violin plots that kind of show you where the majority of people are sitting. And what I'm showing you here um, on the y-axis is the years between receiving a diagnosis of diabetes and receiving a diagnosis of DR or diabetic retinopathy. So I'm really asking, well, if you're taking a dopamine drug, does it delay the onset of diabetic retinopathy? And we found that it did by about two years. So this is pretty preliminary data. Um, and we've just really started to, um, you know, really try to search in this, this large Vinci um, database. And so we're continuing to kind of hone our search um, and make it better. But um, even in these initial studies, um, it looks pretty promising that dopamine drugs could have some um, effect on the vasculature as well. Now, um, I've really tried to emphasize the fact that it's important for um, you know, our, our early screening for early treatment. And that's what I really wanted to uh, you know, use this graph to explain, is that when we have a disease of any sort, and here I'm talking about diabetic retinopathy, we have this untreated disease progression rate. And you can see it here. And at this point in the green box, our body has a number of different mechanisms that are adaptive that kind of keep the disease mechanisms in check. And if we have some sort of diagnostic biomarker, we can actually start to detect when we have early pathology. And if we are detecting this disease during this you know, zone of early pathology, then we can actually reverse the pathology with rehab um, or with some sort of treatment intervention like L-DOPA. And we can also use this, this treatment biomarker to monitor um, the effects of that, that treatment. But if we don't have um, detection of the disease until late pathology, then you see that it's, it's very hard to change the course of this disease. And we, don't, we aren't able to bring it back down into this green zone here. You can see that it maintains in this kind of late pathology state. And I would argue that this is kind of where we are currently are with, with diabetic retinopathy, um, with our typical fundus exam um, detection, is we're in the late pathology and the treatments that we have really doesn't bring us back down to any of these other stages. We kind of remain up here in the late pathology state. And so what we would like to do is be able to really identify early treatments and it could be levotopa, but I actually believe there's a lot of other early treatments that would also be beneficial to diabetic retinopathy. And some we've already tested in my lab um, in fact, one type of, of treatment could be just exercise. Physical exercise um, has benefit to the retina. And we've done some studies in our rodents um, looking at the effects of exercise in diabetic retinopathy and seeing significant preservation. We've also used drugs um, that are neuroprotective like Tudka, which is a synthetic bile acid that has a number of neuroprotective traits. And so I, I think there's many more that could potentially be used um, at this, you know, kind of yellow zone that would allow us to um, preserve or even reverse the course of this pathology. 
Now, one of the things that's really going to be needed um, if we're going to move this forward is to have some sort of novel screening device. And this is something um, that we're developing my, my lab. We have a patent and we've gotten some support from the VA to create a prototype of a screening device um, for diabetic retinopathy that would be very simple, um, that would enable us to detect these early changes. And we envision that this sort of uh, um, a detection device could be used in um, the office of um, the diabetic clinic. So instead of having the patient go to the ophthalmology clinic or an eye clinic somewhere, they'd actually be able to do this test when they're doing their normal diabetic checkup. And we think that that is gonna be a lot more productive. Now, um, this particular idea um, is being licensed um, right now by a company called Lucy DX. And so we're hoping um, that this company will be able to commercialize this device. So I'd just like to end by thanking um, the number of people that collaborate on this project. Of course, this is, hasn't just been me. Um, it takes a, a whole team to, to do this. Um, so there are a number of people in my lab through the years. The, the individuals in blue are the ones that are in my lab right now. I collaborate um, with some folks at the Emory Eye Center, um, Andy Hendrick and, and Mikey Vaughn. And then uh, a number of people at the Atlanta VA. So endocrinologists that are very important um, for, for identifying patients that are, are diabetic um, and also April Ma from the Diabetic um, Eye Clinic. And then of course, I'd like to thank our, our funding from the VA, um, the um, Research to Prevent um, Blindness. And so um, just in ending, I just like to um, emphasize that we really believe that um, having some sort of ERG detecting device is going to enable us to detect um, diabetic retinopathy much earlier um, in this kind of 10 to 15 year window where we're waiting for these retinal vascular lesions to develop. And if we can combine those early detection with drugs like levodopa, that we can actually prevent these vascular lesions and prevent the vision loss. So I'd be happy to take any questions that anybody has. Thank you for that interesting talk, Dr. Pardew. If anybody has questions, um, you can put it in the chat below um, or you can raise your hand. I think there's a raise your hand function. Um, yeah, maybe I'll, maybe I'll start with the first one. Um, so, You've got that 10 to 15 year window before you're, you know, when you're diagnosed with diabetes and then when, when things start to happen. I'm assuming that there's probably a lot of um, factors, physiological, environmental factors that come into play for people that actually might develop the diabetic retinopathy. Um, so if you can keep an eye on that kind of stuff, um, can you maybe use L-DOPA as like a preventative thing. If somebody looks like they're gonna be more at risk for having diabetic retinopathy, I don't know what the side effects of L-DOPA are, but would it be something that maybe, you know what, just take it just for good measure? Yeah, so that's, a, that's an interesting um, question. So, um, so when patients, so levodopa is most often, um, I, I think most people associated with the drug that we give patients who have Parkinson's, right? And um, if, if you're familiar with anybody who takes um, levodopa for Parkinson's, you might be aware that it actually does have some side effects in that population. But they're kind of an unusual population in that they actually, the dopaminergic neurons that are in their brains are actually dying. And um, when we give levodopa to that group of patients, you have to continually increase the dose. And when we, we give levodopa in that way, um, they, they do get side effects from, from the, the, the drug. Now, it's not clear that we're gonna need to do the same thing with diabetic retinopathy. And we're giving a very low dose of levodopa. And in my lab, we've tried to give even lower doses and see if they have um, some benefit. And they do seem to have some benefit. So I think that it's possible you could give a really low dose of levodopa and it would be beneficial. It's also um, you know, tempting to say, well, let's do a, a targeted delivery. Maybe you could do some sort of slow release of levodopa or an injection of levodopa or something like that. 
But one of the things we're intrigued by is the fact that dopamine is decreased in other parts of the body. And so it may be that giving um, levodopa systemically actually helps the brain and it actually helps the kidneys. And that would make uh, a patient that, is, is, that has diabetes actually healthier in a number of ways and maybe avoid some of these other serious complications that they get. Great, thanks. Okay, um, we have a question, um, David? Yeah, it's a great talk, Michelle. Um, I'm just wondering how specific do you think this is to diabetic retinopathy? I mean, do you have any other animal models or examples of delays in OPs? And if you do, have you been able to speed them up with L-dopa and optic neuropathy or something like that? Yeah, great question. Um, so we have not noticed delays in oscillatory potentials in our other retinal models that we use in the lab. And we actually do test a number of different models. So um, we use glaucoma models and we also use models of different types of retinal um, degeneration. And we haven't actually seen those same delays. Now, it is interesting that levodopa has also been reported to be beneficial to patients that have age-related macular degeneration. And that was a retrospective clinical study that, that showed that. And so, um, so it's possible that levodopa is beneficial to other um, retinal diseases, um, which is, is interesting. I'm not sure, I, it, it's unclear exactly how the levodopa is working. So I, I've kind of framed this as we have a decrease in dopamine, we're increasing the dopamine, but there's actually some studies that suggest that levodopa could be protective to vasculature as well. And, and it has some actions on, on the blood vessels. So it could be that levodopa is actually helping the neurons and the vasculature, even if we don't see like this, you know, kind of very distinct vascular pathology at the stage that we're looking at. Thanks. And we have a question in the chat um, from Diane Body. I'm a counselor and have studied the effects of dopamine on mood. Did you find positive mood changes in your patients? Yeah, you know, we didn't actually look at mood in the patients, but that would be a really interesting thing to do. And um, we're, we're beginning, um, we're just about ready to start a new trial, which will be much longer. We have funding to now follow the patients for six months. And I think that would be a really interesting thing to add um, and to see if they actually have in, improved mood. So thank you for that suggestion. I'll, I'll, I'll take that and, and add it to our study. And we have another chat question um, from Abdel Huda. Thank you so much for such a great presentation. Do dopamine agonists show similar protection to levodopa? Yeah, so it does seem that other dopamine related drugs like dopamine agonists also seem to have some benefit. So in our retrospective study that we're looking at um, in the diabetic, or I'm sorry, in the VA uh, database, we're actually um, looking at all dopamine related drugs and we're finding that um, they all seem to have some benefit. We're still trying to determine if some might have more benefit. You could imagine that levodopa might be a little bit more um, generalized in, in its effect where a dopamine agonist is usually targeted at a, a single dopamine receptor, um, which might not be, you know, it'd be more specific and may not have as much benefit, but they still seem to have um, at least some benefit from what we've been able to tell so far. Great. And Dr. Chalky has his hand up. Yeah, it's, you know, fascinating stuff. And I'm familiar with the Brian McKay's work with, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, the uh, dopamine agonists and in, in neovascular AMD, but I'm curious, you know, the VA, having worked at the VA in my past life, you know, they have a state of the art telemedicine uh, infrastructure, right? I mean, yep. I sat in front of a monitor and read many of these <laughs> images. It's really, you know, and of course now with, you know, machine learning and, and AI incorporated into that, you know, really in the diabetic retinopathy world, it, it's really becoming, you know, the, one of the, especially in the VA system, the primary, I mean, it can be so mm -hmm. enormously successful. So I'm really curious as to, you know, it would seem like it would be a natural fit when you, you know, show your data to look at some of these patients who are on and, you know, even at the stage of just having microaneurysms, which is pretty minimal, right? You can identify those. Mm -hmm. and And we know already from various, you know, uh, studies on the progression rates, 
whether you know you all have sat down and just you know looked at the images themselves and say look here we have patients followed for gosh now it's probably been 20 years of a va telemedicine and diabetes you know there's really such a what i would call um you know a, um, a, a kind of standardized approach to assessing diabetic retinopathy. And I'm just curious what you all have done. Cause again, the, the VA would be is a perfect mm -hmm. you know, environment to do that kind of, let's say more traditional uh, approach to understanding diabetic retinopathy. Yeah. So, so thank you for that, that question. Um, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, and, you know, I, I think that the whole, um, you know, diabetic screening model um, using fundus photos is really a success story, right? It's been terribly successful. Like they um, have actually, you know, are able to do these. Um, we're able to detect the vascular changes. You're absolutely right that places like the VA have um, a, a kind of telemedicine type of approach where the satellite clinics can take fundus photos and they send them in to get read. And we can look at these vascular changes. And with um, AI, we're actually able to detect even subtle changes. But, um, and, and, and so we're, we are interested in being able to, to look at that and we are using patients um, from the VA in our studies, but I think what's important and what is distinct from the studies that we're doing is all the patients that we're seeing don't have any of those um, retinal changes in their fundus. Their fundus looks normal and so, this seems to indicate that these um, you know, functional changes that we're able to measure with the ERG are actually occurring earlier than the vascular changes, um, at least the visible vascular changes. And, and so I really think there's an opportunity to change the way we detect um, diabetic retinopathy, which opens up this new treatment window um, that we really haven't had access to before. And you know, just I was, as I was trying to explain, I think that um, the earlier we detect disease, and this could be true for any disease, the better chance we have to actually change the course of that disease and to prevent the kind of late stage changes that are associated with that. And you know, we're very, you know, I think um, most familiar with like cancer therapies and things like that, right? Early detection leads to better treatment outcomes, and I think this is true for diabetic retinopathy. And we just haven't had another tool in our toolbox to be able to determine, you know, where can we detect in this 10 to 15 year window before these vascular changes happen? What's who, who, who's developing subtle changes in, in the eye. And with this ERG, we may actually be able to identify those patients and give them some treatment that will prevent the vascular changes from happening, per, perhaps. That's certainly what I what I hope we'll we'll find in the future. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. I have another question. <clears throat> it's a kind of a general one, I guess. Um, I'm assuming that a lot of this research is probably done more on individuals that have type two diabetes. Um, but I'm but, but I know that type one diabetes can also develop into diabetic diabetic retinopathy. And I just wanted to know if there was any difference between the two types and how, how that disease progresses. And also um, in terms of trying to, you know, prevent, prevent it from happening. Yeah, ab absolutely. That's, that's a great question. So there's, there's definitely some difference between type one and type two diabetes, you know, like kind of historically, we often call type one, like childhood diabetes, because it often shows up earlier. Um, and, and those patients seem to have more um, loss of those um, beta cells in the pancreas so that they have, you know, um, they can't regulate their glucose levels very well because they don't have enough, enough insulin. Um, and, and some of those patients, you know, certainly those patients will develop diabetic retinopathy. Uh, there's, there's no doubt about it, um, you know, then time, um, really, it's just a matter of how long, how long you wait. Um, patients that have type two diabetes, um, we often think of this as, as the diabetes that's more like adult diabetes that usually happens, um, it's often associated with people that are overweight. Um, and, and actually there's, there's a trend for a lot more younger um, children to get type two diabetes. So there's, there's certainly been a, a trend to see more and more of that. Um, but similarly, 
um, both type 1 and type 2 diabetes will develop very similar diabetic retinopathy. So we can't really detect a difference, um, nor is there a difference really reported in the literature where the, the eye disease that's associated with the diabetes is different. Um, in the lab, we can, we can create both models. We can create a, more of a type 1 that has very high hyperglycemia, um, or we can create a more type two model by feeding our rodents a high fat diet and then, um, and then either just monitoring them that way until um, they get hyperglycemia or um, giving them a, a low dose of STZ and that will in combination gives us kind of a type two model. And with both of those models, we also see very similar, um, you know, kind of diabetic retinopathy changes and we still see the functional change and actually the response to levodopa in each one of those models. So I, I think that um, the, the screening method that we're focusing on here and, and even the, the treatment methods that we would develop, whether it's levodopa or other ones, um, would be effective for both type of diabetes. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so I don't see any more questions. If I'm missing somebody, please let me know. Um, other than that, I think I will pass it along to Vanessa or, yeah. <laughs> yes, thank you. Okay, so my name is Vanessa Peterson. I am the development manager at the Retina Foundation. Um, and I am putting a message in the chat if it will let me. Um, Okay, so thank you everyone for coming tonight. So I um, just put a message in the chat for everyone, but Amy Johnson, our chief development officer, and I would um, love to share more about our research um, with you if you have an interest in learning more um, about the Retina Foundation, about research in general, um, please feel free to reach out to us via email or phone. Um, so our information in the chat, and we have um, plenty of ways to get involved. We have um, more lectures coming up next year, so stay tuned. Um, we also have um, an auxiliary um, group that you can join and learn more about on our website. And we are also on all of the social media platforms. So if you're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram or YouTube, please check out the Retina Foundation and um, give us a follow. Um, that's all I have for tonight. Thank you so much, Dr. Pardew, for joining us and educating us. It was lovely to hear um, from you, and we really appreciate everyone for um, joining us. And I will be posting this on our YouTube and sharing it um, in case anyone um, came late or wanted to share it with a friend. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you. Have a great night. It's thank out you. there now. You can never give this talk again. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's on the web. <laughs> That's right. Thank you. It was fascinating. Oh, it it happened so to much. Seinfeld too. <laughs> okay. Thank Take you. Care.